Hey everyone, welcome to our YouTube channel Neat Yuk. In this particular video session, we'll be discussing a very important concept that is binomial nomenclature. Have you seen starfish or jellyfish? Are they fishes? Why, then why they are called as starfish or jellyfish? Uh, let me take one more example. In India, there are different types of snakes are there. King cobra, cobra, crate, wine snake, etc. You know, all different types of snakes in India are called as samp. If you go and ask a farmer, he says samp for king cobra, samp for cobra, samp for wine snake, samp for crate. Correct? It's confusing, right? I have a question to ask to you. Do you have a name? Yes, obviously, you have a name. To explain this concept, let us assume that your name is, I'll write here, Vinod Kumar. Just assume that your name is Vinod Kumar. Vinod Kumar is your legal name. Okay, so what exactly the meaning of legal here? Simple, this is a name given by your parents at the time of registration of your birth and apparently it appears on your birth certificate correct so this particular legal name that is Vinod Kumar can be used officially everywhere and at the same time even your parents have given you a name and normally they call you uh, in for example let me just write like this they will call you like Vinu correct it is your nickname for, okay so I'll write here nickname okay so Vinod Kumar is your legal name Vinu is your nickname why I have written all these things very simple I just want to relate this thing with this simple let us take Vinu the nickname and I'll compare this to the vernacular name whereas Vinod Kumar the legal or official name I'll compare it to the scientific name simple uh, let us take one more example I'll make you understand here say tiger the scientific name of the tiger is Panthera tigris. If you go to Tamil Nadu, there normally the people speak Tamil language, correct? Okay, so they call the tiger as Puli. In Hindi, tiger is called as Bug. In Urdu, tiger is called as Sher. If you go to China, the same tiger is called as Hu. I'll write here. It's quite difficult to pronounce. Okay, so like this. In China, tiger is called as who in Tamil tiger is called as Puli. In Kannada it is called as Huli. See the change in the names, correct, of the same organism as we change our geographical area. As we move from one place to other place, the name of one organism changes. That is actually the thing to remember. That means, see, organism has particularly a vernacular name. Vernacular name is nothing but, you know, the local name. Okay, I'll write here. It is actually the local name or it is also a common name. So this particular local or common name is restricted to particular area or particular language. So that means this is called as vernacular name which varies from place to place. It is not constant. Correct. So as a result, it leads to confusion. So how exactly it leads to confusion? Very simple, you go to Tamil Nadu and you know, for example, you speak Hindi and you, you know, for example, you know, in normal, if you move to South India, normally they speak Tamil, they or maybe the Malayalam or maybe Kannada. Okay, they don't speak Hindi actually, they don't know much about Hindi. Okay, so you go there, Tamil Nadu and actually you say, you, you for example, you see a tiger and you say like, you know, Sher or in Urdu you say like, sorry, in Urdu you call it as, uh, call Sher. Suddenly like you know a Tamilian who is standing uh, before you and he may wonder like what is this person is saying correct okay because in Tamil it is Puli so she in uh, Hindi it is Bag or in Urdu it is actually Sher so there is a confusion right if you go to the international level let us assume that you know there are numerous uh, taxonomists you know sitting in front of you and obviously we're going to speak about tiger and you start like you know uh, you start your speech tiger is something like wild animal suddenly like you know the taxonomist or biologist from austria germany or maybe china they may wonder what is this person is talking about on which organism he is talking about that is confusion so that means vernacular name leads to confusion so to avoid it 
you know the numerous taxonomists developed a standard naming system of an organism and we call it as scientific name it is giving a standard name to the living organism that is actually the scientific name for, for the first time you know the carolus linnaeus i'll write here okay so I'll write here the carolus linnaeus actually he developed a naming system of an organism and that is famously called as binomial nomenclature what is exactly binomial nomenclature it is nothing but scientific name so the definition is, you know, goes like this it is the naming system of an organism which consists of two components how many components two components that is the first component is generic name and the second component is specific epithet so that is actually the thing i'll write here okay so okay scientific name also called as technical name it's like a legal name actually okay so in binomial nomenclature it contains two components that is generic name is the first component whereas you know the second component is the specific epithet remember it so generic name is the genus name it generic name represent the genus whereas specific epithet represent species okay so that is actually the thing to remember now let us understand what are the universal rules of binomial nomenclature very important for your neat okay so listen to me carefully simple i have written some organism scientific name here you could see here i have used different colors actually here and you could see the pattern also correct okay you can easily make out see and moreover if you read it see mangifera indica is the scientific name of mango panthera leo scientific name of lion whereas canis familiaris is the scientific name of dog and solanum tuberosum is the scientific name of potato c and you know if you read all these things it sounds different right it is not like english or maybe like not indian language oh, it's very different right okay i'll tell you why very simple actually okay see first you know let us talk about the universal rule this is one you know one organism scientific name mangifera indica so it, i'll write here mango okay so mango so let us talk about mango now the mango scientific name simple i have written mangifera and then a space gap is there then indica okay the first rule says that i'll write here the first rule it should contain two components you know the two components the first component should be see this is the first component so that should be the genus name whereas this is actually the second component so that is actually the specific epithet so generic name the first component and indica the second component is the species or specific epithet remember it so that is actually the first rule okay it should contain two components one is generic other one is species or specific epithet okay the second important rule of it so when you write the generic name obviously it should start with the first letter of the generic name should be in capital letter see here this is generic name this is generic this is generic this is generic and you could see here m p c s yes, all are in capital letter right so that means all the genus name should the first letter of the genus name should start with capital letter and then the species name obviously should be in small letter so capital letter the first letter of the genus name should be in capital letter whereas small letter you know in, in specific epithet it should be in small letter so we'll write here okay so genus first letter should be capital whereas species in small letter okay so that is actually the second rule and the third rule see i have written i just you know i written on the board actually so that means it is handwritten right you know so that means see when you write genus as well as species a species name obviously you have to underline them separately you could see i have used yellow color to underline mangifera and indica and i have underlined separately i have underlined mangifera and species that is indica separately you could see here i have used the yellow color even you could find the same rules i have followed correct so that is actually the third rule so when it is handwritten so you have to underline genus as well as species name separately 
for example if you are typing it on the computer very simple you type the name like manjifara indica then after that no need to underline it simple you just have to select the manjifara indica then control and press i that means it will be italics correct you are changing the font of this that is actually it will be italics it will be in italics so that is actually the thing so when it is printed obviously it should be in italics this is actually very important it should be in italics then actually the fifth rule i'll write here okay so the fifth rule is after writing the scientific name you have to write who the author of this particular organism who has described this particular organism see this particular organism was described by carolus linnaeus for the first time so we have to write i'll okay i'll erase this now we have to write the author name like this i'm going to write carolus linnaeus in short that is lin and put a dot here that's it lin and put a dot here so for example i'll write here lin and a dot just close the bracket so this is the fifth rule you have to mention the author okay then actually the sixth rule which is not in the ncrt but let me tell you see when you write the genus name it the minimum number of letters should be three the minimum three but it should not exceed more than 13 letters so genus minimum three maximum 13 same is applicable to the species also it should be minimum three letters maximum 13 letters okay so that is actually the thing to remember so see another important role of binomial nomenclature is whatever the scientific name you give to an organism that should be derived from latin or greek language so that means actually see mangifera indica it's i said like you know uh, like uh, it uh, sounds different, correct? So it sounds different. Panthera leo sounds different. Can is familiar, sounds different. That means actually all these you know, scientific names are derived from Latin or Greek. For example, you are a scientist or taxonomist and you have discovered a new organism and you are going to follow binomial nomenclature and you give a scientific name where you don't find a proper word in Latin language. Then what do you do? For example, I said that your name is Vinod Kumar. Just assumption, correct? So now you are the Vinod Kumar and you have discovered a frog species. In normally South India, there is a common frog species called as Ravarchistus. I'll write here. Ravarchistus is a type of bush frog. You have discovered a spe species of Ravarchistus. So now you are trying to give a name to it, but you don't find the proper name in the Latin. Simple, you know, you can ask the permission from International Code of Nomenclature, and you know, if they give you the permission, you can put your name actually, but it should be Latinized. See, you have to derive the name from the Latin. If you don't get, you get the name from the Latin, you can put any name of your choice after the permission, but it should be Latinized. Remember it. It should be, it should sound like Latin. Okay. So that means Ravarchistus. So we know here, I'll write here, the species name is say Vinodiensis kind of it. Ravarchistus Vinodiensis. So this is actually the new name after following the binomial nomenclature rule that you have given to a bush frog. That is actually the thing to remember. Why Latin names or Greek names are actually used? Simple, because actually Latin names are dead language. Nobody speaks, obviously. So there will be no uh, chance of spelling mistake or confusion, right? Because nobody speaks about it. So remember it. So you may get this question. So why Latin language is used in binomial nomenclature or giving scientific name to any organism? Simple. That means Latin language is a dead language. Nobody speaks that language in the world right now. That's to avoid any sorts of confusion. So that's all about from this session. Actually, in our next session, we are going to discuss about synonyms, tautonyms, autonyms and international code of nomenclatures.